Good afternoon. Welcome to Fabernet's Financial Results Conference Call for the first quarter of fiscal year 2023. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session and instructions on how to participate will be provided at that time. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. I would now like to turn the call over to your host, Carol Tumajanian, VP of Investor Relations. Thank you, operator, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's conference call to discuss Fabernet's financial and operating results for the first quarter of fiscal year 2023, which ended September 30, 2022. With me on the call today are Seamus Grady, Chief Executive Officer, and Chavez Ferra, Chief Financial Officer. This call will be webcast and a replay will be available on the investor section of our website, located at investor.fabernet.com. During this call, we will present both GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures. Please refer to the investor section of our website for important information, including our earnings press release and investor presentations, which include our GAAP to non-GAAP reconciliation. In addition, Today's discussion will contain forward-looking statements about the future financial performance of the company. Forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from management's current expectations. These statements reflect our opinions only as of the date of this presentation, and we undertake no obligation to revise them in light of new information or future events except as required by law. For a description of the risk factors that may affect our results, please refer to our recent SEC filings, in particular, the section captioned risk factors in our Form 10-K filed on August 16, 2022. We will begin the call with remarks from Seamus and Chaba, followed by time for questions. I would now like to turn the call over to Fabernet's CEO, Seamus Grady. Thank you, Gerald. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on our call today. We're off to a strong start in fiscal 2023, with first quarter results that exceeded our guidance. Total revenue was $655.4 million, with a better supply situation than anticipated, which contributed to our strong performance. Revenue increased 21% from a year ago, or 17% when we adjust for the contribution of approximately $20 million due to the 14-week quarter. In other words, revenue would have been $20 million lower if not for the additional week. Demand remains strong across the board, with sequential growth from nearly all the end markets that we serve. Supply for some automotive components saw relief in the quarter, resulting in a supply headwind to revenue that was only about half of the $25 to $30 million we had anticipated. We also executed well to produce non-GAAP operating margins of 10.7%, consistent with our record fourth quarter and a full percentage point higher than the prior year. Revenue upside and strong margins helped drive non-GAAP EPS of $1.97. Looking at the quarter in more detail, we delivered a record quarter for both optical communications and automotive revenue, even after considering the extra week in the quarter. In the second quarter, we expect to start seeing optical communications revenue further supported by our new partnership with DZS, a global leader in access networking infrastructure, service assurance, and consumer experience software solutions. Through our partnership, DZS will transition sourcing, procurement, fulfillment, and manufacturing activities in its Seminole, Florida facility to Fabernet. We believe this new systems win has the potential to be a significant contributor to our growth when fully ramped. Turning to non-optical communications, we had an especially strong quarter. Automotive revenue was up more than $30 million, or more than 50% sequentially, as improved component availability allowed us to capture more revenue than anticipated in the quarter. Overall demand from our customers remains very strong, which makes us optimistic about our future. While supply constraints remain a limiting factor on our growth, we continue to focus on managing supply conditions as effectively as possible. From a capacity perspective, we are very well positioned to serve increasing demand. Last week, we held an official ribbon-cutting ceremony for Building 9 at our Chonbury campus, adding approximately 1 million square feet of space. While we are maintaining our practice of letting our customers take the lead 
in announcing relationships, we are very pleased with the early demand and traction at Building 9. Looking at the second quarter, we remain optimistic that strong demand trends will continue to drive growth, both year over year and sequentially, after factoring the additional week in the first quarter. We also remain confident that we can continue to realize incremental operating efficiencies as revenue grows faster than expenses. In summary, we had a strong first quarter with results that exceeded our guidance. We are optimistic about continued demand in our markets and we're well positioned to extend our track record of success as we look ahead. Now I'd like to turn the call over to Chaba for additional financial details on our first quarter and our guidance for the second quarter of fiscal 2023. Chaba. Thank you, Seamus, and good afternoon, everyone. We delivered strong first quarter results that were above our guidance ranges. Revenue in the quarter was $655.4 million and represented strong year-over-year and sequential growth, even after backing out the approximately $20 million contribution from the additional week in the first quarter. With excellent execution, we delivered our best-ever non-GAAP growth and operating margin for the first quarter. These strong margins combined with foreign exchange tailwinds and higher interest income produced record non-GAAP earnings per share of $1.97, which was 18 cents above the high end of our guidance range. Looking at the revenue in more detail, optical communications revenue was $497.6 million. Note that growth comparisons to prior periods should be adjusted by the additional week in Q1 but we believe that optical communications revenue would have been up both sequentially and from a year ago, excluding the impact of the additional week. Within optical, telecom revenue was a record, $404.9 million. Datacom revenue was $92.7 million. By technology, silicon photonics revenue was $138.9 million, an increase of 3% from a year ago, and decline of 8% sequentially. The sequential decline is primarily due to approximately $15 million revenue that had shifted from Q3 due to alternative part requalification. Although datacom business tends to be more variable on a quarterly basis and continues to be impacted by supply chain headwinds, we anticipate that our datacom revenue will increase sequentially in Q2. Revenue from products rated at speeds of 400 gig or more was $195.2 million, up from a year ago, as well as sequentially. Revenue from 100 gig products remains stable and was $139.6 million, up modestly from a year ago, but down sequentially. Non-optical communications revenue was very strong in the first quarter, at a record $157.9 million and represented 24% of total revenue. Growth in non-optical communications was driven primarily from automotive revenue of $86.8 million, up 80% from a year ago and up 55% from last quarter. During the quarter, we took advantage of availability of components that had been in short supply enabling us to deliver meaningful growth. While the component supply environment remains challenging and may result in declining automotive revenue in Q2, we anticipate that strong demand will produce healthy year-over-year growth. Industrial laser revenue was $35.4 million, down 5% sequentially, but remaining stable with longer-term trends. Other non-optical communications revenue was $35.7 million. As I discussed the details of our P&L, expense and profitability metrics provided are on a non-GAAP basis, unless otherwise noted. A reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP measures is included in our earnings press release and investor presentation, which you can find in the investor relations sections of our website. We executed very well in the first quarter to produce particularly strong gross margins for the first quarter at 12.9% just below our fourth quarter performance. We achieved these strong results despite the headwinds from annual merit increases, which were largely offset by increasing efficiencies and continued foreign exchange tailwinds. 
Operating expense in the quarter were $14.7 million, or 2.2% of revenue. This produced operating income of $70 million, or 10.7% of revenue. This performance represents our ninth quarter in a row of generating record operating income. As a reminder, the vast majority of our revenue is in U.S. dollars, as are the majority of material and component costs. However, a significant portion of our labor and operating costs are in Thai baht. Through the cash flow hedging program we have been following for many years, we are able to enhance our visibility and smooth out the impact of foreign exchange fluctuations over time. Nevertheless, from time to time, we could see larger impacts as a result of currency revaluation of balance sheet items. And in Q1, This resulted in $2.1 million, or $0.06 per diluted share foreign exchange gain. The current interest rate environment combined with our strong balance sheet contributed approximately $1.2 million, or approximately $0.03 per diluted share. Non-GAAP net income was $72.4 million, or $1.97 per diluted share, which is another quarterly record and was above our guidance range. On a gap basis, net income was $1.76 per diluted share. Effective tax rate was 1.1% in the first quarter, but for the year we anticipate an effective tax rate in the low to mid single digit consistent with our history. Turning to the balance sheet and cash flow statements, at the end of the first quarter, Cash, cash equivalent, and restricted cash were $499.9 million, up $21.4 million from the end of the fourth quarter. Operating cash flow was $60.6 million, with capex of $10.3 million. Free cash flow was a quarterly record at $50.4 million. In fiscal year 2023, we will continue to execute on our plan to return surplus cash to shareholders. During the first quarter, we repurchased approximately 47,000 shares for a total cash outlay of $4.9 million. Approximately $95 million remains in our share repurchase authorization. Now I will turn to our guidance for the second quarter. We continue to be optimistic about demand across our business, as well as our ability to effectively manage supply constraints. While the component supply environment saw specific pockets of relief in the first quarter, and we continue to expect improvements over time, these supply handlings continue to persist in many areas of our business. As such, our Q2 guidance assumes a supply chain headwind of 25 to $30 million. For the second quarter, we anticipate revenue in the range of $640 to $660 million. This represents both year-over-year and sequential growth, after backing out the contribution of approximately $20 million from the additional week in the first quarter. We anticipate non-GAAP net income to be in the range of $1.86 to $1.93 per diluted share. In summary, our first quarter result provided a strong start to fiscal year 2023, with record revenue and earnings, which both exceeded our guidance. With continued favorable business conditions, we are optimistic that our track record of success will extend into the second quarter. Operator, we are now ready to open the call for questions. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1-1 on your telephone. Again, that's star 1-1 on your telephone to ask a question. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Alex Henderson of Needham. Please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, just a little clarity uh, to start off with on the um, supply chain comment. Um, so, and thirty billion dollars in the automotive was an impressive improvement, but I, I guess the, you know, to to a large extent, most of the people following Fabrenet are more focused on the optical side. 
did your supply chain improve on the optical side? Um, because if I just take the $30 million out of the, uh, uh, out of the revenues, uh, you were in line uh, with our prior forecast. Yeah, hi, Alex. Um, yeah, we, we, we called out the improvement on the automotive. And just to, just to remind our automotive business is made up of – the improvement was in the new automotive business, which is made up of uh, electric vehicles and also LiDAR. Uh, we have to see some improvement. It's too early to declare victory yet, but we, ha- we have started to see some improvement. And I think what's particularly encouraging for us is seen specific component shortages get cleared, we're seeing that demand that we've, you know, we've been, you know, we've had some pent up demand, let's call it, for some time. Once those component shortages are clearing, we can see the revenue impact is almost immediate. So, uh, and, you know, this past quarter, the most of the, the biggest part of the impact was on automotive, some on the optical side as well, but mostly on the automotive side. And as, like I say, as we clear those shortages that have been, you know, plaguing us and, ev- plaguing us and everybody else for some time, it is converting to revenue very quickly. So, so does that imply that the the majority of the um, number that you threw out, I think it was 25 to 30 million dollars uh, of uh, supply constraints in the quarter, has a shift in the mix to more optical supply constraints and maybe less auto supply constraints? I mean, how do how do we measure? How do we think about that? Yeah, for last quarter, yeah, I think that'd be a fair way to look at it. Most of the constraints were were on the optical side. I see. I see. And, and just going back to uh, the, the, the baseline businesses, um, you gave uh, a fair amount of granularity on on, on the outlook. Uh, but I, I think, could you talk about what you think the uh, datacom and telecom, um, you know, 400 gigs, uh, silicon photonics are going to do on a year-over-year basis since we have that extra year confusion? Um, you know, how, how do you expect those to behave uh, uh, year, year over year as opposed to quarter to quarter or adjusted for the quarter to quarter if there's some way to do that. So, hi, Alex, this is Chava. So let me take that one. So I think you, you meant to say extra week we had in Q4 uh, rather than extra year. Uh, so uh, uh, our week, silicon yes, photonics... I misspoke. All right. So our silicon photonics have been very strong uh, both sequentially and on quarter on quarter, uh, on year on year basis as well. So we continue to see 400 gig uh, growing. Uh, the primary driver that we earlier uh, spelled out was driven by 400 ZR, which came off from a uh, low base, obviously, this year. We continue to uh, see very strong uh, demand uh, in that space. So both silicon photonics um, and, obviously, the higher data rates uh, remain very stable, even though on a sequential basis, uh, you see a sl- slight decline in silicon photonics revenue, but that has to do with a 15 million extra revenue that we had in Q4 from a prior quarter. So overall, we are very optimistic about both silicon photonics and the higher data rate businesses that are coming down the track, both on telecom and datacom as well. And again, the year-on-year growth was primarily driven by, by the 400ZR, which remains uh, very strong for us. Yeah, I was really talking about in the guide for the fourth quarter whether you thought Datacom and Telecom would grow on a year-over-year basis uh, and, you know, any calibration of that within the guide uh, is what I was looking for. So we we anticipate that the higher data rates will continue to grow. So I in the in the prepared remarks I mentioned that our data com business uh, remains very strong, although uh, some of the supply constraints were mostly uh, uh, in our datacom uh, business. Again, those supply headwinds are still ahead of us, but, but we are very optimistic about the, uh, the growth rate there. So we, we do anticipate uh, probably a slightly higher growth rate in datacom uh, and for going into next quarter. And Obviously telecom? subject to supply constraints. And telecom, any sense? I'm sorry? And what about telecom? Telecom also continues to be strong. Again, that's that's impacted by supply constraints, but we do anticipate that to continue to grow. Yeah. Again, we, the demand is is holding very strong in uh, across the board. Uh, the the caveat here is still that we we are not out of the woods from supply perspective. We still have about 25 trillion million dollar baked in our our guidance. So that's mostly uh, across the board, but uh, subject to so those supply constraints, we do anticipate uh, both segment of our business to grow. 
Okay. Thanks, Bill. See the floor. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Samik Chatterjee of J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my questions, and congrats on the strong print here. Um, I guess I had a couple, so I'll just um, sort of go through those. One, uh, I mean, if you can talk a bit more about the DC SI um, business win, um, and I know you said you, that business starts to ramp up in the fiscal second quarter, but sort of how to think about the contribution from that business or that new win for the year, how big do you see that opportunity being uh, in the long run? Maybe if you can give some more color around that. Um, the second one, uh, I did sort of adjust your fiscal first quarter revenue for the extra week, the $20 million that you said, and I think still the se sequential growth um, that you are implying at the midpoint of your guide going into 2Q is a bit softer than what we saw you sort of execute on last couple of years. So I'm just wondering, like, if you can talk to the sustainability of the non-optical revenue in the quarter. Um, is, is it that you had supply improvement and pulled through a lot of backlog, which is somewhat limiting sort of the sequential improvement that we see or the sequential growth that we see going into F2Q? Um, those are the two questions. Thank you for taking the questions again. Thanks, Anik, and thank you for the, for the comments. Um, I'll, I'll take the first question around uh, DZS, and then I'll turn it over to Chaba for the question about the, the outlook. Uh, yeah, the, the DZS uh, business, you know, as, as you know, we don't size specific deals. But, you know, this is a meaningful program uh, that transfers production from DZS's Seminole facility in Florida to our facilities in Thailand. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's part of our strategy. We continue to execute our strategy to add selective complete network system business, and we have a good track record of that now over the last, the last uh, couple of years. In this case, we're transferring from high cost, high cost location to low cost location. Again, with the meaningful revenue upside, we're not going to size it, but it's a meaningful revenue upside, and it really is a perfect fit with our strategy and capabilities and our track record of, you know, executing transfers very effectively and efficiently and allowing our customers to realize savings uh, quickly. Um, you know, DZS has other manufacturing capabilities, so this, this represents a portion of their production, but it, but it is a meaningful deal that we're, we're proud to have won. You know, we, we worked hard to win this deal. The competition was was uh, strong, we believe, and we're, we're very very happy to have, to have been awarded business. And look forward to engaging with DCS to, to transfer production. Um, and again, it, it reflects the overall opportunity in the system space, which we you know we've been very optimistic about, and I think we've we've proven to be effective at. If you go back to you know the Infinera Corian win a few years ago, then the Cisco business that we transferred this is, this will be the third. Let's call it meaningful or significant complete network system win that we've had in the last few years. So, <clears throat> so I think this is trouble. Let me take the uh, guidance section and the growth part of it. So as, as, as you mentioned, if you back out the extra $20 million from our Q1 revenue uh, year on year, you would see about 17% growth uh, in Q1 versus last year. And our guidance at the midpoint uh, for Q2 calls for about 15% uh, growth on year on year basis. Again, as a reminder, in Q1, we, had, we saw a, a significant improvement in supply availability, so that, that explains a little bit higher growth rate um, uh, than what you anticipate in the Q2 guidance. Nevertheless, again, if you go back to the supply uh, headwind commentaries I had, uh, we baked in about 25 to $30 million supply headwind. So overall, I think uh, our growth rate is and has been consistent with our longer-term plans of about 15% growth rate. Um, and I don't see any, any major change in the trajectory of the demand environment. We are still operating in a, a supply-constrained um, uh, area. So that's one of the reasons why we are a bit cautious about uh, the guide, uh, which is still very strong, 15% on a year-on-year -year basis. Correct, correct. Thank you. Thanks for taking my questions. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Again, to ask a question, press star one one at this time. Our next question comes from the line of Fahad Najam of Loot Capital. Please go ahead. Hey, thank you for taking my question. Um, 
I'm still trying to get my head around the um, your comment about improved supply chain. If my math is correct, the automotive revenue grew quite extensively, probably more than the entirety of the supply chain headwinds that you've talked about. So is it that the automotive supply improved and, and the optical communication uh, supply chain worsened? Uh, can you just help us understand, maybe clarify things a little bit more? No, I think the, I think the, the, the non-automotive or the optical perform pretty much in line with our expectations, but automotive did improve, you know, better than we had anticipated. And we were able to convert those. It's a handful of components that have been in short supply for some time. Once they, once they became available, we were able to convert that, that kind of pent up demand into revenue quickly. But the, uh, you know, the, I think the revenue on the, on the optical side of the business was pretty much in line with our expectations. Appreciate that. So, Given that there is a massive backlog in the automotive uh, uh, segment for you, how should we be thinking about growth in the automotive space? It seems like your commentary seems to suggest that optical communication supply remains challenging, but how is it looking out for automotive, and, and how should we be thinking about automotive revenue throughout the rest of the year? I think it remains challenging for Had across the entire business. You know, we, we I think we, we got a couple of breaks, let's call it, in, in the automotive business, but the supply situation remains challenging across the board. If anything, you know, the, the breakthrough we had in automotive last quarter, what it what it demonstrates, we think, is I know there's been a lot of concern about is is the demand real, is there double ordering going on? What we've been seeing is as the component availability clears, that demand is converting into revenue immediately. So the demand is there. The demand is is is, uh, is real, we believe. Uh, but the you know the supply constraints it continues to be challenging across the across the board. I wouldn't see it as being clearly better in automotive or, or or you know better or worse in an optical. It's you know it's similar across the board. Got it. And then one last question for me, uh, and then I'll hand it over to the floor. Uh, in building nine, how much of the uh, square footage is now? Looking for. Yeah, we don't report that metric, uh, Fahad. We've we we had a, an opening ceremony there last quarter. Um, you know, we're very happy with. I'm sorry, last week, uh, last week we had the opening ceremony in um, in. I'm actually in Thailand right now. I was here for the for the opening ceremony. Uh, we're very happy with the progress there. You know, we've we've a number of customers, but we're not going to be uh, announcing or communicating metrics like occupied spoken for those type of metrics because they don't really mean a whole lot other than to say you know the vast bulk of the growth will be will be uh, seeing over the next while will be will be in the building nine location you know our pinehurst facility is more or less at capacity uh, build, building eight is at capacity uh, so the growth you know over the next while will be in building nine but so you know, if I, I would say we're, if very, I, we're very happy with the progress there if I recall, I think last quarter you guys said you had two anchor customers for building nine. Um, so any anything else you can provide, like customer count, just trying to measure how much better is it getting? Well, we have yeah, we have two um, two anchor customers. We have other customers who were you know were actively working with nothing nothing to announce yet, but actively working with to get capacity set up there. And again, a lot of the new business that we talked about, like for example the the DZS uh, win, uh, that will be ramping in Building 9. Uh, so, you know, most of the growth, as I say, there'll be, there'll be exceptions here and there, but for the most part, the majority of the, of the growth for the next while will be in Building 9. I, I would say, if I, excuse me, if I compare it to, maybe if I can answer it this way, if I compare the, let's say, the rate of, of expansion, the rate of revenue growth that we envisage in Building 9, which again, just remind us, is a one million square foot facility. If I compare it to where we were at the same period um, in building eight, let's say back in, you know, 2016, 2017 in building eight, I think the rate at which we will grow building nine, certainly right now, it feels it feels faster because remember when we opened building eight, it was our first facility, our first factory in the new campus in Chonbury. There was a certain amount of maybe reluctance on the part of customers to be the first one to go there. So there was a little bit of reluctance 
Uh, but you know, now we're five years down the line, that building is full. And from the customer's point of view, they don't really you know, differentiate between building eight or building nine. It's all the Chandra campus. It's fully ramped, it's going very, very well. So I think our, our you know, the willingness of our customers to ramp in building nine is, is completely different to, to what we had you know, five years ago in building eight. So we feel, we feel very good about our ability to grow and, and add business to building nine quickly. Appreciate the uh, colors, Shannon. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Alex Henderson of Needham and Company. Please go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, so I just wanted to dig into the uh, interest line and the FX line. Um, uh, so, when you look at the guide that you gave for the December quarter, I'm assuming that the $2 million in FX falls out of it and that it's effectively back towards uh, towards zero. Uh, and similarly, uh, if I look at the interest line, I'm thinking that with interest rates going up, uh, you know, certainly here, but uh, probably on a global basis, and I assume that you've got a fairly short-term orientation to your current uh, uh, massive cash balances. Uh, should we be expecting the interest uh, income line to go up, and will the FX uh, uh, zero out? So, hi, Alex. <clears throat> so yes, your math on the FX is probably right. Uh, we typically don't guide the revaluation below the line FX uh, uh, line. So we, uh, as we realize the actual revaluation, we will that will flow to the bottom line in the actual basis. But the interest rate, the elevated interest uh, rates, obviously, are going to translate to a higher interest income for us. So uh, the trend has been going on in the last uh, couple of quarters. So obviously, you can see that picks up in our uh, interest rate line. Uh, with uh, our strong balance sheet and, and cash balances, we do anticipate a strong contribution going forward. So again, to simplify your question, affects out interest rate uh, uh, to continue to contribute. So just just going back to the interest rate line, it's up uh, about a million dollars sequentially. Is that predominantly a result of uh, the change in interest rates, or is there something else going on there? And should I be thinking of that rate of increase is what you're likely to do over the next two or three quarters on a sequential basis, given rates are up, at least in the U.S., 4%, uh, which uh, is a pretty – pretty big increase uh, on your cash balances. Uh, I would think that that would have a pronounced impact uh, on interest income. Can you just give us some sense of what the trajectory over time looks like there? So, yes, indeed, the uh, the incremental uh, sequential increase in, um, in our interest income has to do with the increased uh, interest rates. So, again, we don't like to speculate how is that going to work out in the future, but Indeed, we have a very strong balance sheet, and uh, we do anticipate that to be a meaningful contribution as we look at But you're not really speculating if you just assume existing interest rates. Uh, so no further guidance of whether that magnitude increase that we saw quarter to quarter is at least the, the assumption they used in the December quarter? Uh, I'd like to stick to our core business when we, we give guidance out and, and leave the interest rates and the exchange rate as a side commentary. So I wouldn't go to further details in terms of guiding interest rates. Okay. Um, I just wanted to go back a little bit into the uh, the other areas. Um, have you seen any uh, you know, change in the demand as a result of um, your ability to supply the the and the auto segment, I mean, so with $30 million extra shipping, uh, there could be two responses. One, oh, boy, I just got all the stuff I wanted. Or two, wow, I got what I wanted. Here's some additional orders because if you can get more, I'd like more, um, which, you know, could certainly play into your backlog. So can you talk a little bit about whether what happened when you delivered that extra business to that segment? Yeah, I think, Alex, you know, it, it, it hasn't resulted in really any change in the demand. The demand is just very strong, and, and it really is a case of once we get the components, we can convert that, that pent-up demand into revenue and, and get it shipped. You know, we've had, we've had strong backlog in, 
really all all of the markets we serve, automotive in particular, uh, you know, and in this case, once we were able to clear that component or a couple of components, we were able to very quickly convert to revenue and, and, and get it out the door. Um, but no, it hasn't resulted in additional demand. I think the demand is already very strong. We will be happy if the demand remains and just converts over time as we as we're able to, you know, get a breakthrough on these component shortages. And just to be clear, when you talk about your your backlog, uh, you're not taking into account the I don't remember what the number was. Well, I guess we'll, we'll get an update on it tomorrow with Lumentum, but I think there was something like $75 million worth of backlog there, and that's not taking into account the one point, um, or excuse me, the $4.4 billion backlog at Siena. That, none of that's factored in, correct? Yeah, we, we don't actually talk about our backlog, Alex. Um, we don't size it. We don't really talk about our backlog other than to say if it's – it's very strong, and we have we have visibility for much further out than we would normally have because of the component supply situation. The, back, the backlog is very strong, but we we don't actually actually size it. And then trying to foot, you know, how much of Lamentum's backlog is included in our backlog, how much of Sienna's, we we don't know. We just go by the demand that we get from our customers. We don't try to round it with right. with the numbers that they're projecting to the street. I'm afraid. Yep. Appreciate the time. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, sir. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to turn the call back over to Seamus Grady for closing remarks. Sir? sir? Thank you for joining our call today. We're off to a strong start in fiscal 2023 with first quarter results that exceeded our guidance ranges. We, ex we executed well to deliver strong margins despite seasonal headwinds, which increases our confidence that we can continue to deliver strong performance as we look ahead. We look forward to speaking with you again and seeing those of you who will be attending the Needham Conference next week. Goodbye. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.